Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to this live webinar of a very special launch of Johnny Clegg or Skay's autobiography, uh, Catalling of Africa, my early years. Uh, he wrote the book in the final five years of his life. And uh, I have to mention here that it was superbly edited by, by Alison Lowry. And we'll speak about Alison's work on the book uh, a bit later on. I'm especially delighted because Johnny's sons, Jesse and Jaron, are here with us to talk through, uh, I suppose, our limited journey uh, with our ancestor today. Uh, limited because mm -hmm. an hour is not enough. Um, Jesse, as, as you all know, is a, is a musician um, in his own right. Jaron is a filmmaker, graduate of the Vancouver Film School, is about to do a science fiction series, which uh, <laughs> he's uh, going to be pitching somewhere, and I'm looking forward to all of that. So welcome to both of you to, to this, uh, and anyone else in the family who's watching. So as I said, sort of an hour is not enough uh, to touch on, I suppose, the universes and worlds that uh, Johnny Clegg, this uh, troubadour and the sage, he would hate being called the legend because in his book he says he doesn't like the dross of ego. So let's not call him a legend, but legend he is. Uh, these are the universes that he lived and sang and, and celebrated in many ways. So in order to try and enter the, the life and times of, of, of Johnny Clegg, I'm going to sort of whittle it down to two things that mattered a lot to him. And hopefully this is a, a window into a larger conversation with, with, with the two of you. But let's begin with uh, his identity. As, uh, as as Johnny Clegg. His mother has a very strong role to play in his life, Muriel, your grandmother. She opens the world for him. She's curious. She's a jazz singer. Uh, but there are men who come into his life, uh, and and Johnny explores this identity as the child of, born in England by accident, illegally in South Africa until he was seven. So I'm not sure which one of the two of you would like to pick up on that sort of small entry point, and then we'll move on to his masculinity. <laughs> Um, uh, Jack, do you want me to, I'll, I'll take yeah. the first one if you want. Sure. Um, yeah. well, thank you for having us. This is wonderful. And I'm just seeing in the comments yeah. from okay. all the, all the different people from all across the country and, and abroad. So thank you for having us. Uh, we Thanks are very joining. proud and excited to finally be able to share this book with the world. Um, there it is. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think... Um, Look how beautiful. <laughs> Look how beautiful. <laughs> and there's lots of amazing yeah. photos in the book as well. So, um, yeah, excited to share it with everyone. Um, yeah, and as, as you said, he, he, you know, the, the book is, is really his origin story. And he wrote about a particular period of his life, his early years, where he, um, he first encountered... Um, Zulu culture and first encountered um, Sipo and Charlie Mzila and all the people that were formative to him as, as a young man. Um, and I think that, you know, there, there are so many surprising elements um, about his early childhood that he writes about. And of course, his mom is a, a figure that looms large. Uh, she was a very eccentric um, and creative person. She loved poetry and literature uh, and was a singer in her own right. Um, but also someone who was, had very strong opinions and had her own uh, complicated relationships. Um, at one point, um, my dad's stepfather kidnapped his sister, which my dad writes about, and there's actually uh, some news articles from that moment. And, wow. you know, you just get the sense that he, um, he grew up in quite a chaotic household. Um, and even though Muriel was um, someone who, who he dearly loved and who, who who, who supported him in, in so many ways. I mean, even going as far as to drop his first demos off at the record label and, and try and uh, coax Hilton Rosenthal into working with my dad, which he eventually did. Um, you know, she was also um, a troubled person in, in, in certain ways. And I think that, you know, my dad, because he didn't have a, a stable um, home environment, it, it kind of was a catalyst for him to be a seeker and to be trying to find a way of, of accessing the world, a way of understanding the world that made him incredibly open to Zulu music and to uh, the philosophy of, uh, of warriorship that, that the Zulus gave him. Um, and so it's just one of those strange things where, you know, your, your weaknesses are your strengths and your strengths are your, weak, are your weaknesses. And, um, 
uh, you know, I, I don't, I, he, he was just, he, he had such a strange specific number of pressures and, and insecurities and, and difficulties in his home life that were partly manifested by his mom and by his father and stepfather that gave him this openness, I guess, um, to, to other worlds and other possibilities. John? I mean, you know, yeah, in the end, uh, he, ta he takes his identity back to uh, Uduwai in Tanzania, you know, yeah. so he begins uh, looking at it as, as, as this a white boy with a Jewish mother born in England, uh, growing yeah. up in Africa and in what was then Rhodesia, you know, finding a lot of magic there. And, and Johnny's also very, as you said, uh, Jesse, open that he sees everything. He sees silences, he sees the right. garden, you know, so I don't know if you want to yeah. just add to that. I, I mean, that was very well, perfectly said. I mean, just to add to that, I guess it is, it is, he had this very, this uh, insane from an early age of very, uh, a large amount of like worldly experiences that, yeah, that created this like congruence that um, allowed him to like, he was innately curious as a kid and was, he was the most curious man I knew, I've known my whole life. And I think that the yeah that congruence of things and chaos and 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 uh, all these kind of um, variables in his life did cre just somehow coalesced into into him really uh, filling you know a void uh, perhaps with with you know the, the Zulu culture and 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 really embracing it and being embraced uh, obviously on the other side of the aisle. I think he was an ultimate insider, outsider, outsider, insider, all over. You know, some people are just an outsider, insider, and uh, <laughs> but he, but uh, but he accepted the the, the position, uh, um, and and then went off and started. You know, uh, uh, well, his identity as a man is is, is very interesting in this book, and mm. we often don't discuss masculinity or identities as fathers or what men should be, and it's very clear that Johnny had a, a longing for. Uh, some sort of father figure or male kinship, beginning, of course, with Dan mm. Pinar, his stepfather, this colorful journalist who exposes Johnny and takes him with him, you know, camping mm. and, and everything else, to, to Charlie, who starts to teach him how to play the guitar on those rooftops in uh, mm. uh, the flatlands of Berea. Uh, Sipo is more a, a, a contemporary of, of, of Johnny's rather than a, than a father figure, but he represents the masculinity and comfort and uh, of the tribe of of men mm. together and 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 this is definitely found in the migrant uh, zulu hostels where, where johnny is he's drawn to all of this so mm. um how would you say johnny experienced his masculinity you're both men jesse you've just become a father to a, to your daughter maya with your wife danny um is this something the two of you think about because it was very strong in his life the idea of warrior mm. culture being a man and while he understood the problematic underlying, I'll read later on. I mean, the book is fantastic in it, how it unpacks mm. ideological constructions of masculinity as well. That's the anthropologist in your father. But I don't know yeah. which of you would yeah. like to pick up on that. Well, I think for myself and I've, I'm sure for Jess as well, I mean, the the paternal values that the Zulu culture, you know, uh, and, and the masculine values definitely did carry through into his into him being a father for both of us and he and you know whenever whenever we do face challenges or if you know if we have a tough day we we, we definitely do channel our dad because he, he 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 definitely was that figure for us what he what he kind of lacked growing up and what he found in so many father figures and of course in the zulu culture he definitely was that for us and um you know so kind of a the epitome of that was his final years uh, with with this disease. It, it was he he took it on with such a, a warriorship, and it was it was genuinely like he it was the bravest thing I've ever seen. And I that gives me you know along with everything else he gave us you know, strength to take on every day. But Jason, mm -hmm. if you want to add. To that. Well, he he would he would say to us that you know when when you become a father, you also father yourself, um, and I think that that was his experience um, of becoming a father and and learning about fatherhood, in that um, he you know so much of his music is about searching for 
connection, searching for a human connection or searching for um, the spirit of the great heart, you know, searching for this, this, this deeper meaning, this, um, this, this grand trajectory. And I think, um, I think that that was linked to his, his, um, his lack of a father uh, and, and his connection to Zulu culture that had this very um, defined way of understanding that as a man, there are, there are phases to life. And no matter what your circumstance is, you have to, you, you know, your, your attitude and how you come to these um, challenges is all that you can control. And I think for my dad, that was such a powerful message that, you know, there, there, there are these predefined hierarchical structures that a man has to go through as a boy, as a young, as a young teenager, you know, and, and then as you grow up into your 20s, you, you become a warrior and then you become a, a father and then you become a grandfather and you, you know, you, you have your homestead and then eventually you become an ancestor. Um, and I think that it, 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 it shaped his life. It gave him a way of understanding who he was. It made the music so much more meaningful and tangible. Uh, it, it, it allowed him to, it allowed him to manifest his own individuality with confidence and with clarity. Um, you know, I think as a young man, we all, we all look for things to fight for and things to rage against. Um, and I think in, in, in that way, he, uh, he, he found that in Zulu culture. And I mean, the, the story that Jaron often tells is, you know, at his, at his deepest, deepest core as a man, um, you could really feel his Zulu-ness. Um, and, you know, even when he, you know, if he had a bad day, uh, or, or, you know, while he was going through chemo, or if he had uh, something that, that was really stressing him out. You know, he never, he never spoke to therapists. He never did any of that. He got his Zulu stick and his shield, and he walked out into the garden, and he did a, a Zulu gear, which is a, a banishing ritual. It's a, it's a dance to, to banish whatever your foes are, whether it's the, the, the foes in your mind or your enemies. Or, and, and, the, and, you know, we would always... You know, we would be sitting at, at <laughs> after school doing homework and just see dad in the garden doing a Zulu gear and just <laughs> think to ourselves, okay, dad's having a stressful day. He's just banishing the, <laughs> banishing the demons. Yeah. And <laughs> but it's, uh, you know, we really had this feeling that it was more than just, it was more than an anthropo anthropological study for him. It was a deep, yeah. deep, profound, philosophical, profound connection that actually was a part of his being. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Um, also interesting that because Johnny, in a, in a sense, talked about talks about the body being something that carries a life force. That's how he saw it. So mm -hmm. the dancing outside, you know, is an expression also of trying to control that body that you must one day leave as a life force, which is very much part mm -hmm. of the everyday, you know, existence of Zulu people. I must say, what's interesting about your dad is I interviewed him once, and I'm a feminist, you see, and and sat opposite what I could feel was a was a patriarch. It was so interesting, <laughs> um, uh, but but uh, you know, I, it, 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 you're quite correct. The manifestation was definitely there. But what I did notice with him is when he spoke Zulu, he was a different person to when mm. he spoke English. I noticed that Johnny was animated. He was funny. He was relaxed. Um, he was accessible, and the minute he started to speak English, he tended to be a little bit more reserved and, and more polite and sort of more the academic. And coming from a multilingual home, I know how much a language can liberate you. And so for, for Johnny, it appears also Zulu uh, as a language um, mm. animated him or gave him a life that he absolutely adored. Um, you know, do either of you speak Zulu? Can <laughs> Yeah, I don't we, 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 It's cool. We we're nowhere near as fluent as he was. But, but, uh, you'll never be. We, you'll never yeah. be. I mean, but there's so, a lot of Zulus who aren't as fluent as, as, as well. Let's say that. Let's say that. No, but, yeah. um, no, I agree, man. I think you know, language is such an amazing thing. It, it it's it's a it's a way of seeing. It's a way of being. Um, and my dad always um, told us that and, and expressed that. And um, so many of uh, the Zulu philosophical ideas can only be expressed in Zulu. You know, that's why there's actually a quite a lot of Zulu yeah. in the book where he actually just writes in Zulu because it's the best way to, to express it. Um, and, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I just, I wish I was a, a fly on the wall to hear, 
you know, to hear the conversations that that Sipo and my dad had in those oh, times. They're brilliant, know, eh? They're like brilliant. Like about the moon landing and about like the monkey hearts. The monkey hearts. <laughs> yeah. I yeah. mean, the two of them are probably stoned as well. What we're speaking about here is a fabulous chapter where, where Johnny writes this magnificent piece about what this, what the heart means to a Zulu man or a Zulu. What is the heart? You know, it is the locus of emotion and dark secrets and treacheries and treasons and then Johnny tells Sipo that they've done a heart transplant. Oh no, they've done a monkey heart transplant and that two yeah. of them riff uh, from a Zulu perspective about how white people are already so mad they're going to the moon but now you're giving them monkey hearts they're going to, you know, it's just brilliant. I agree. Yeah. I yeah. And, and, you, and you, get, you, you get the impression that that conversation could not have happened in English. <laughs> <laughs> never. Yeah. It could never have happened in English. Yeah. That's what I, but you know, that's also what the book does is it takes you into these deep, intimate spaces in Johnny's soul, uh, a, a, with his friendships as well, and the fears and all sorts of and sorts of other things. But um, just quickly, both of you, you know, were very little. There's some beautiful footage of you in that video that people watched in the beginning, uh, touring on the road with him. Um, uh, of course, that's all you know. You don't think it's weird or odd, and you're a musician and you're a filmmaker, so you've both chosen jobs which allow you, I suppose, a certain amount of freedom. Uh, what was that like? Yeah, it it was the greatest uh, adventure. I mean, I think it's very different, you know, when, you, when you're a kid and you're kind of careless, you don't have any care in the world, and you get to, you know, really just freely take in this, this, this world, even though, you know, it may be a very stressful tour, you know, that my dad is going through. Um, yeah, we, we had amazing adventures. It was, it, it really gave us, uh, you know, Jesse can speak for yourself, but I think the, the, such a worldly perspective and just in terms of culture and language and, you know, kind of, I mean, Europe was, was this like melting pots of eye-opening experiences for, for myself and for Jess. Um, and yeah, it, it, it was, yeah, it really was. It was just like an, an adventure of a lifetime and so many fond memories of just like being on the tour bus. Like the tour bus was the greatest. It was just the, the, the best place. Like we didn't, I didn't, we didn't want to hang out in hotels. It was like if we we're on the tour bus, that was what we were most excited for because you could hang out with the band, you know, in the back of the bus and just and just hear all these stories and um, and just, yeah, and taking the world as, as, as you pass it by. Um, and you know you sleep in bunks uh, so we used to literally would have weeks on end of just being on this tour bus uh, like through europe or wherever we're going and uh yeah it was uh it was it was pretty wild and and, and uh yeah just such an adventure mm. yeah i think um for me um you know as Joan said it was a, it was an incredibly stimulating uh way of growing up as a, as a child, you know, um, to, to travel like that. For me, the impression that, that it left on me was just this, the, the magical power of music, you know, just, just to travel to places that, that I've never even heard of, you know, they're speaking a language that none of us speak and to, and my dad is on stage playing Zulu music, <laughs> singing in English and Zulu. Wow. And, and there's just, you just, you, it's just so overwhelming to, to see this, the power of music to transcend language, to transcend politics, um, you know, ge geographical boundaries. I mean, it, it's, it just gave me such a love for music and such a profound connection to it. Um, and I, I guess also the, you know, the, the unglamorous side, you know, which was um, how difficult it is, you know, to be a career musician, to, to live on the road, to give up family time. I mean, me and my brother also were, uh, at home when my dad was away, sometimes nine months of the year, you know, and, and I felt that um, we, we both felt that absence and it was really hard in some ways. But we always had this sense that, you know, that, that there was something very special that we were sacrificing for um, and, and that it was, it was worth it and we felt connected to it. You know, I don't know how we, we all felt that, but I mean, I certainly did that this was something, this was our, our gift that we had to you know, there was a sacrifice that came with it in all art. Um, so for me, I mean, kind of gave me, it gave me a love for music. It also gave me a really uh, disillusioned view of what it is to be a musician. I was kind of nervous when I started <laughs> being a musician myself. I was like, geez, this is a, this is the real deal. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, what, what's so interesting is Johnny also sets out in the book those early years of trying to get number one. I mean, you're, the, the, you know, if you look at how you work today, uh, Jesse, and how your dad had to work under apartheid legislation, first of all, dodging caretakers, dodging cops, dodging all sorts of people in townships and everywhere else, and then trying to arrange concerts, you know, mm. with, uh, with Juluka, when, first of all, the SABC doesn't want to play your music. Mm. Um, it, it, and then you're in a highly volatile political situation, and he just carried on. Yeah. He just did it. And, and the book will also teach people kind of what it's like to, in the end, be schneid by everybody. What I love about your dad is that, he, you know, along with Sipo, at the end, he sees the world as a trickster. That he says here that at some point in their lives, everyone sees through the world, and it's a big laughing confidence trick, you know. Um, uh, but he's learned how to step around that those confidence mm. tricks thanks to his connections with uh, with Sipo and and others as well. So um, yeah, that it's is funny. incredible. When, whenever I would complain to my dad about you know something to do with the music industry, you know, my song was you know didn't get playlisted or something like that, he would be like, dude. I was getting arrested. <laughs> like, you'll, be, you'll be fine. fine. <laughs> yeah. And he yeah. and he used to yeah he used to take he used to take kind of uh, weird joy when when we would come up against challenges uh, in in what in our in our careers he would he he he'd always have a smile in his eye or even laugh outright when you when you told him what you know what you were dealing with and you mm. know I think it's part of uh, part of understanding you know what he went through you know you have to you have to there, there's always a struggle there's always mm. as an artist he says you must suffer <laughs> you, you're young you're an artist you must suffer that's what you, you will suffer. suffer yeah and i think that there is you know in 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 migrant labor philosophy there is this deep stoicism and this strength mm. this incredible yeah. strength to just push through uh and just to 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 bear the weight um, and, you know, it was funny, like, um, especially when he was in his final years, you know, where he was going through chemo and he was, it was, it was really hard for him. I don't think we can, he, he didn't cancel. He, I think he canceled one show in that entire time. You know, we were still, we he was still playing tour. shows. I mean, he did world tours and he, you know, he had that, I mean, it's, it's the, it's the, the description of the bull, the stubborn aggression, the, the stubborn determination. You know, it's that stoic, stubborn determination. A man must do his job, um, and it's it's just an amazing. I mean, you know, it's 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 filtered through the idea of masculinity, but it's actually a a, a brilliant um, way of approaching, um, you know, getting through life and just expect expect the trouble, and just know that you are a <laughs> yeah, you're a you're 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 a, you're you're an immovable object. <laughs> I mean, he describes actually beautifully um, exactly that uh, when the, I think at some point the caretaker comes up to the roof and mm. shits on Charlie for having uh, 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 Johnny up there and actually threatens to, to fire him. And mm. Johnny works for the, watches for the first time a Zulu man rise up inside as a warrior and basically say to this white guy, are you sure you want to do this? You know, uh, yeah. it's not going to end good for you. And he just stands his ground and the white guy leaves. And so, you know, in the midst of a man to have just you know, dislocated from his family, left up in a rudimentary room on the top of a ceiling or on a roof in, in Berea, yeah. you know, he watched the man claim exactly that mas masculinity in a sense. Mm. But what's also interesting about John, you say the dancing towards, you know, while he was still ill, he he felt he possessed the life force. There's no doubt he felt yeah, it at absolutely. some point. He connected with it. And the dance, too, um, I'm not sure if either of you ever sort of, you must have danced with him, but the dance for him was about escaping his body in a sense uh, as well. Um, in many ways, the training. Um, mm, transcending. Uh, yeah. He got, he got into it because that part of Johnny's then warriorship becomes very important to him as well. And uh, what I love about the book, too, is that the Zulu understanding of time and how music is measured in, in, in rhythms and times and how you, mm. when you are disempowered and you are working class and you have nothing, you make mm. your world out of these rhythms and these times. And then also when you owned a concertina, I didn't know that, <laughs> that when you get a concertina, you've made it. You're like, you're a Makuru player, you know. Yeah. Um, so the dance was that, was that something that, as you said, he went outside and and worked it out but he was also a good karateka so let's not forget yeah. that when he was yeah, younger yeah. 
Well, I think going actually going back to that question on language, you know, he 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 told. I mean, it's it's an incredibly powerful story of when he actually, you know, first discovered like these migrant uh, dancers in the hostels. You know, he he would he, he saw the dance, and it, for him it was. I mean, it genuinely is the these different. You know, if it's bata or if it's like different um, Zulu, Zulu dances, they they were conveying messages with your body. You know, it's, it was a it was actually a language a language in and of itself. Um, and it was the most potent and visceral language that he had ever seen. I mean, he obviously he he had no frame of reference for this. And when he discovered, like like the you know, he he, he heard the ground shaking, kind of coming close to uh, getting near, nearer to these hostels. Uh, when he finally discovered that these dance teams like moving in um, sync and and these these uh, kind of key hero players coming out into the space and just performing these. These moves, which, which were, he uh, he described it beautifully as they're they're they can be contradictory. You know, they can be they can be like, you know, I'm strong but I'm weak. You know, and 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 they they were such uh, it was such a profound language that he desperately he wanted to he wanted to be able to express. And he you know it was it was kind of through that journey um, you know with Sipo and. Uh, you know, Dudu and all these, all, all the dancers that he, he ended up working with, he he was able to express it himself, and it was such a cathartic thing to to be able to to speak in that language, and I, and that's why I think it was, you know, all the all the all the things he went up against, you know, in apartheid, setting up shows, shows getting cancelled, um, and and really just all the walls he had to break through. At the end of the at the end of the day, you know, he was really doing it because this this along with you know the whole zulu culture but this language of dance was something that really he loved and really spoke to him and gave him strength and allowed him to just say things that he, and uh, you know stretch your body in a way that he, yeah that you know he he had never seen before so yeah to uh, hope that answers that question mm, it does beautifully absolutely beautifully jesse you want to add anything to that about that language, the communication of dance? Um, I think Jaron covered it. I mean, I think that the, the one comment that, that he's, he, he I, I remember him saying about dance was, you know, with music uh, or, with, or with sculpture or with painting or dance, um, as Jaron said, these are all languages. And if, if we could say it with words, we would say it. But there's some things that are better said this way. And I think that my dad had this deep connection that something was being said in this dance that was a message that he he needed to hear and that he needed to embody and, and, and manifest for himself. He just had this deep recognition, this moment where he sees it. And he writes about that moment in the book, firstly with the music, where he hears the music and it just it just overwhelms him. It's like this tidal wave of emotion. And he and he and he just asks to you know the, the, it's it's so fascinating you know I think a lot of people have this view of my dad that he was this politically you know he, every that he had this sort of political thrust in in what he in, in what he did and when you read the book you realize that he was actually a lost young man looking for meaning looking for friendship looking for um, a way a means of expression um, and it's it's really innocence and curiosity. And and the luck of meeting these amazing, generous people that that shared this wisdom with him, um, and it's just it's you know it's 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 a beautiful um, testament to that human connection that was so rare in South Africa in that in that moment in history. Well, he writes in the own book. He says, "I've always had a natural, childlike, and innocent acceptance of my place in the world," and that's a really interesting. Uh, what what Johnny did for other white South Africans like myself growing up at that time, and as we know that time, uh, you know, uh, not being in any way exposed to cultures which have value to add to a worldview, Johnny brought to white South Africans who were interested and 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 lived side by side with people stories of their lives. The language. I mean, how many of us can sing Ibola Le to MP, uh, all of those songs? And, and what I was so struck by also um, 
is that what has happened to KwaZulu Natal and Zulunus has become almost hijacked by the shenanigans of, or well, not even shenanigans, well, I don't know how to describe them, of Jacob Zuma, and the politicians, and issues around the king. And what Johnny writes is that politics found him. And mm. the kind of politics that, that he ended up doing was about trade unions, it was about workers. He stayed true to where he found his source, um, mm. which, which was there. And what the book does for me again is it's a celebration. And, and it's, it's a difficult one because Johnny doesn't shy away from what tribalism means. Mm. Uh, um, and it's not, it's not good. You know, this is before you know, uh, um, one could be cancelled because you were dancing a dance that's not yours. So Johnny talks through uh, his love and commitment to, to Zulu culture and language was nothing about expropriating it. It was becoming it. And so mm. the time, I think, I hope it adds to a conversation in South Africa of that being Zulu is something which is multi-layered and wonderful and to be celebrated. And as much as we loved what Sipo and Dudu and Johnny and them brought to us, we, we need to go back and see it again because the wisdom in this book is timeless and ageless mm. and offers you a very clear worldview that not many white people know, you know, and Johnny mm. sung, it, sung it all his life, I suppose. Yeah, I think that uh, I think I agree with that. I think that um, the one thing that we just feel really um, excited about in 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 sharing the book is that it really is a version of South Africa that is so profound and beautiful and original. And it's mm -hmm. and my dad had such a unique view of so many of these uh, complex cultural complexities um, and always humanizing it, always sensitizing us to um, the deeper message and, and the principle and explaining it and communicating. You know, he was an amazing communicator. Yeah. And I think that, um, as you say, you know, South Africans, we, we have such a, we're a complicated country, you know, and we have, um, we, 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 sometimes battle to find our common ground. And I think that my dad, um, with it, you know, with it, no matter who you are speaking to, when you hear the philosophy of what it means to be a Zulu and what it means to be a man or what it means to be a father, um, these are universal principles that are, you know, you'll find in any, in any culture, in any religion. Um, and, and there's, there's something so, something to celebrate about that, especially as South Africans, you know, and, and we, we are all part of that story and part of that journey. So I think we, we just feel excited to share something that I think will give South Africans a lot of pride and a lot of comfort and a lot of connection <laughs> to their <laughs> country. Yeah. Yeah, that's um, well said. That, 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 and we need that right now. I think that, uh, you know, the uh, Dibule Ndebele, uh, Professor Dibule Ndebele wrote, and I'm talking about the white psyche because we are all pale and we're pale Africans. But until you identify with the black body, until it becomes, until you are with it, with uh, the people around you, you, you will never understand or be part of what it is. And Johnny, Johnny did that for us. And it's, he's our ancestor and uh, we should treasure him for that. There's some questions I just wanted to read to the two of you. We, we've got about half an hour left and we'll get back to some other little topics if we, if we have the time. But in the meantime, I'm just telling you, you won't regret reading this book. It's fabulous. Johnny's in the room with you, talking to you. Sipo's laughing, telling you jokes. Um, <laughs> it's, 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 he really is. He really is. Steve Anderson's asked the question of the two of you. Uh, what advice can you give to extremely busy fathers, especially those away from home for long periods, as to how to ensure their bond with their family stays strong? Um, that's a lovely mm, uh, question. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm learning that as, as I go along. I've only been a father for six months, so it's, <laughs> but I can only speak from my experience as a son. And uh, the one thing I'll say is, you know, to me, when my dad was present with us, he was always completely present. You know, he, we, we always felt like we were his priority, that he always made a special place in his life for us. And we knew that... Um, we knew that when he needed to go to work, that he was sacrificing for us. You know, he gave us the sense that that he um, that we were his we were his number one priority, and we always I don't know I, I I don't even know how he did that. You know, he just I think it was just because when he was with us, he was so present and he gave us so much of his time and energy. 
that we always got the sense that um, even though he wasn't around all the time, that he uh, his heart was with us. Uh, Dennis Bailey says, chips off your old dad's yeah. block to listen to you both. And um, then he asks, has it been hard to surface your own ambitions? And then, Jared, somebody wants to know, what does your cap mean? Isn't it Sergeant Pepper's clothing company? Your hat, SPCC. Everybody thinks there's a sign and everything. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's Sergeant Pepper's Sergeant Sergeant Pepper, Pepper, Sergeant Pepper, Sergeant Pepper, Sergeant Pepper. Yeah. South, South African company, buy, the, buy their stuff. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, sorry, uh, so Gosh. has it been hard to surface your own ambitions? That's a good question, since the two of you are here. Mm. Um, um, Jay, you I guess, yeah, I'll, uh, quickly, I mean, my, I definitely had a, I've had a, certainly an easier, an easier route than Jess. Um, I, I think, you know, I'm, I'm in the, the film world, but it's still in the entertainment world, so I definitely had a great frame of reference, uh, just having a father in entertainment and yeah it um he 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 definitely made it very clear to us you know regardless of where you go as an artist you know you can do this um you can do what you do what you want to do you just you really have to want to do it because it isn't a life that you know it, it, there's it's not a, it, it's not all glamour and glitz it is something that you really have to uh uh push to to want to do and and really uh, throw everything your your whole self into it. There's no there's no halfway uh, kind of sacrifice. You you really have to put your whole being into into um, yeah being an artist. And um, film is certainly quite similar to music. But um, yeah, he 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 left. He 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 definitely you know touring and and kind of having this worldly perspective definitely left a mark on us. That you know there was something a lot bigger out there and that we could um aspire to 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 do you know great things and big things with with you know you know with self self-expression and his career is, is a testament to that i think jesse for you maybe a bit more difficult um well you know i don't know as you say you know it's like i don't know any other scenario you know this is the this is the scenario that i'm in and uh, i guess you know in in some amazing strange way you know my dad had that stubborn determination uh you know and he had his own challenges and you know as as we mentioned he was he was in a political situation where he was literally being arrested uh for playing music <laughs> with his friends um yeah, yeah and and that stubborn determination really um you know, really inspired me, I, th I think, you know, and, and I, I had my own challenges when I first started, you know, I think people were expecting me to be a certain type of musician or a certain type of artist. And, um, you know, I, I, I stayed true to my own expression and my own connection to what I, uh, what I create. And, and I think my dad was always really proud of me for that. You know, he, he always encouraged me to, to find my own way and find my own journey and find my own world of expression my own language of expression um and so um it you know it's a blessing and a curse um you know beyond beyond having an amazing father and a role model you know there's weird preconceptions that people might have and you just have to stubborn determination man you got to be the bull <laughs> yeah and it's yeah. much less than what your big bull was dealing with so don't yeah, you, yeah. Don't you exactly. here with, with us don't you that, come here and, i know that's what my dad would always say he's like listen you, you're not in jail there we go. <laughs> um amy winston winston is asking an interesting question uh, just you know for everyone watching you know this is johnny's early years and he what i love about how johnny's written and if you're looking for anything about his private life and family there's nothing there it's the stuff that 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 took johnny out into the world that made him think that let, let the levers go off in his mind and his body um and in so doing he will take you into the country into places you've never been and 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 through those experiences there are questions being asked here about cultural preparation johnny answers it for you like the academic he is in the book read it it's really interesting so amy asks uh, did everything he writes end up in the book and is there any more material and shortly before we came onto the uh, the webinar i was uh, talking about alison lowry's uh, job with the book maybe we speak a bit about what mm. material you have used and if there is any idea for something um, um yeah i mean you know the, it, i think it is uh it is worth saying that you know 
towards the end of the writing process, my dad was quite sick. Um, and I think that there, there is, uh, you know, he, he definitely wanted to write more uh, and maybe zoom in on, on certain subject matter and, and um, expand on the timeline of the book. You know, it, it's anyone's guess uh, if he had had another five years or, you know, he may have, he may have, um, he may have dived in deeper. Uh, but we had what we had, and and at the at, at when he passed, uh, you know, we went through all his notes and all his um, recordings, and he just he, the way he wrote it is that he 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 sat down to write, and whatever he was thinking about that day, you know, an anecdote, a memory, uh, a, a, a moment in his life, he sat and he wrote it. So we had this collection, this beautiful collection of of memories and anecdotes, um, and. The the editor uh, that we worked with, Alison Lowry, who did an amazing job. She, um, our brief to her was that we don't want anyone to write for my dad or in his voice. We want it to be completely um, his writing. We just want someone to help us make it cohere. And um, and I think that the approach she took was amazing. She she instead of trying to find a chronological order, she split the book up into thematic chapters. So when he's talking about Zulu music or the walking song or his friendship with Sipo, you know, and, and the, and all these um, timelines and moments and messages and meanings uh, kind of all cohere around one theme. And it's, it's like, and she compares it to the Tugela river and all the tributary tribute uh, tributaries that, that, connect, that, and yeah. connect in this web of meaning. Um, so yeah, I think she did an amazing job, and you know, I think that th there was a second book that he was hoping to write, which would which would have been about uh, Savuka and his his later days. None of the family feature in the book because we it predates us. <laughs> he was a yeah. he was a teenager, yeah. 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 so yeah. we weren't we weren't born yet. <laughs> yeah. But um, yeah, I think I think that it's anyone's guess what he would have written. I think that he really got a, an amazing taste for writing, and I you know we were so pleasantly surprised when we saw what a great writer he is i mean we always knew he was a great lyricist but i mean his his uh his writing in this book is just it's so conversational and so um so human and so connect you know the connection it, it, as you say you feel like he's in the room with you so you know i, I wonder if he would have had a, a second career as a writer if he had had the time <laughs> Jared, I mean, uh, you want to add anything to yeah, that? I mean, is there a lot left over? Um, is there? Uh, what are your feelings about how it was done and 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 being with yeah, him, knowing the know, book is going to get published and he won't be there? Um, I know. He must have known that uh, as well. Yeah, and that is well. Just to that point, it is why we really consider it um, like one of his last gifts that he gave us, because. Well, firstly, I mean, going back to what you said about Ego and what he what he talks about, he had that even approaching the book. I mean, he really he wrestled to really force himself to write this book. Uh, he was a man who always looked forward, and it was part of kind of this warrior ship. And uh, there were many walks like with him, just talking to him and him just saying, "Yeah, I don't think you like. Who cares? Why? Why? Why my story? You know what?" And it, it was like we were all, we all had many just nights of saying, like interventions, like, no, you have to, you, you have to keep writing. What are you talking about? If, you know, this, you're, everyone wants to know the, you know, the, the journey behind the songs and the story. So that was certainly, it was something he had to acclimatize to, to actually, um, to face. But, you know, my dad was, he was a meaning and a narrative junkie. Uh, he 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 looked at things in, in like in terms of narrative uh, all the time. And um, yeah, he. I mean, his life is a is a melting pot of wild experiences. And it, this this was really an exercise of like consolidating with it and stringing it together. And I think it became what was initially quite hard for him. It became very cathartic, you know, especially in in terms of dealing with what he was dealing with um, to have to, to now string this, this, this uh, beautiful mix of a life together in, in, uh, in, in story form. Um, yeah. So we, we feel it is, 
it is incredibly special that we have this. And sorry, I, I don't want to go on too long. No, but no, no, no. Don't be silly. When we finally, when we finally kind of, you know, got, he had it on his phone. He had it on his on his laptop. And there were many times like where he almost lost the whole book. <laughs> like he 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 would sometimes like some he he deleted the document at one point, and like we literally oh. had to retrieve it a few times for him. But when we finally got to really read the entire body of work that he had, you know, that he and all the transcripts of all the notes, we there were many things we weren't even as his family we weren't privy to. Um, and I think it was something as it was something he discovered as he as he wrote, um, as he actually confronted these experiences. And so we were so pleasantly surprised. And again, it, it, it felt it still it is this gift uh, that he gave us some further deeper dive into his life for us to to, you know, to all uh, for his family, but for everyone else to 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 see and recognize. And um, yeah, yeah, so. Can you think of an example of something specific that really surprised you or that struck you that you didn't know that you found out going through it? The book? Yeah, I mean, the like smaller detail, like the the minor details that he went into. You know, he wouldn't he wouldn't completely he he he. You know, as as a dad, he'd say, yeah, you know, I'd struggle. We had struggled to go, I'd struggle to go to Zuland. You know, when I was a kid with seeps, so, you know, it'd be a, it'd be, a it'd be a tough uh, tough thing to get there. And you're like, yeah, I'm sure it was. When you read the detail of like you know, of like the the, the bus uh, going you know, the bus <laughs> the bus ticket, and you know, the bus driver being like. Completely perplexed by him. Yeah, how did you get in here? <laughs> yeah, like, and and, uh, and and you know, he he would he would tell us about kind of the well at length. He would go on at, at, about kind of the magic of of you know the, the of Zululand and that world. Um, but he he talks about it at length of you know how the Tugela River Valley opens up and it is like a doorway into this other world. And just kind of how, how deep he went into some of those anecdotes. It was really beautiful for us to connect with and to further kind of discover. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I think for me, the, the surprising moments, I mean, I think just the general impression when I read the full, when we read, you know, we had versions of the manuscript and the first version that I read you know, after compiling all the notes together is, I, I, I was just so, it was so mesmerizing. It read like this adventure of a lifetime. It wasn't how I expected it to read it. You know, it felt like, it felt like Lord of the Rings or something. I was like, Dude, this is like a fantasy novel. <laughs> it's so beautiful. <laughs> um, so that was a surprise. And, you know, I guess like, you know, you always hear stories about your grandparents or your great grandparents, you know, growing up and, you know, we, you never really, uh, we never really, I think very few people get to read a, a, an actual, you know, document that re that records the, the the meandering path of their family life. And, you know, when I actually got to read about my dad's childhood in, you know, in chronological order and in, in massive detail, I was, it was so surprising and it was shocking to realize what an un unorthodox childhood he really had, uh, what a chaotic childhood he had. Um, how little moments along the way he picked up things, you know, like when he was in Zambia and it was, mm. you know, it was the first time he'd seen a, 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 a non-racial country mm. that that uh, that that was mixed race, um, and um, you know the other things that you know, it's just the, the minor details, like like when he talks about entering Vits and the, all the complicated ideologies that were coexisting at the time on on every spectrum of of, of politics. And how, as a young man who had all this experience with Zulus entering this world of ideology, how you know these people grappled with who my dad was, and my dad actually grappled when he when he um, when he meditates on on that moment. It's so fascinating to me. You know, you get this rich sense of the history of South Africa and the, and the, how all the politics were filtering into the into academia and anthropology and you know it's it's just such a a, a fascinating 
And then I think um, the, Marx, the Marxists were saying that uh, you know, you know, a tribal identity is is a ideological superstructure, you know, mm. and 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 how it should be dismantled. And your dad, you know, offers the counter argument. It's a thrilling read. Uh, really yeah, and 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 the and the conservatives were also uh, anti the tribal, tr you know, That's tribalism. Right. And and so you had on the left and the right, they actually ironically agreed with each other. And my dad right. was yeah. my dad was like. I don't, you know, I'm I'm coming at this from a completely different place, and and I've had so much value from this culture, and so much wisdom and philosophy. You know, it's it's just it's so fascinating. Like, you know, to 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 be in in that moment in time that my dad was in, and to to enter that world is it's just this incredible catalyst of of an interesting moment in time. I just for me it was just fascinating. We just mentioned before, I want to read some of, of Johnny's own words and, and, and look at another question or two, that there was a series that Johnny did, um, A Country Imagined. I think it was a six-part, mm. seven-part series, mm. which was screened by the SABC a few years ago, which was absolutely magnificent and should be required mm. viewing for every mm. school in this country because it takes you it, with absolutely. love and Johnny's arrival and marveling at the rocks and the people and the music and the birds and the everything around him, you know. Um, in the epilogue, I love what um, what Johnny says here. He says that the only insight you'll find on top of a mountain is the insight brought up with you. Exactly. It was always there, silent and waiting for you to look inward. Mm. And, and that's what he's done in this yeah. book. I mean, he's absolutely uh, taken you to all those magical pathways of things, how you should open yourself up, which is what we should do in South Africa, because... Uh, you can keep being Zulu and you can keep being Afrikaans and you can keep being white and understand what it means. But, you know, contain multitudes. You can contain multitudes. And the more mm. multitudes you contain, the richer the life, which is evidenced mm. in this. As you say, this is like Lord of the Rings, people. <laughs> <laughs> At some point. Uh, we've, got, we've got about five minutes left. And here's a question for you, uh, Jesse, from uh, Conald Allen. He says, did you and your dad record any more songs together? And are there any lost recordings that might um, come out? Um, so uh, for his final album, King of Time, I was the executive producer. And so we, we worked on that whole album together, which was wonderful. Um, I've Been Looking was the song that we co-wrote and sang together. Um, and we've actually got a new song that has just come out uh, with a... Uh, it was one of the, the last times my dad was in studio uh, creating and songwriting. Uh, we were in LA and um, an American band named Walk the Moon, um, who are a, a, a really well-known American band, um, they uh, were huge fans of my dad's. And so we went into studio and we wrote a song with them, which has actually just come out about two weeks ago. So, And it's actually my dad's last, uh, his last time in studio. So it's, the song is called Fire in Your House. Um, so check that out if you want to hear my, my father's last uh, collaboration with me and Walk the Moon. Um, and there are, you know, we, we do have a, a vault of demos and songs that, that, mm. that, that my dad wrote. But, you know, we, to us it's just so precious and, you know, maybe there'll be a time and place where that we'll time. find it. Yeah, I think, I, I, mm. I think that um, yeah. we're still in the, we, you know, for us every little piece of expression of his is just so precious to us and we want to make sure it feels right if and when uh, we do put anything out. Sharon, you know, you're the filmmaker, you're the, you're the, uh, is there a possibility that at some point in your life, uh, you know, your father could be a feature of something or is, or is that not, uh, is that not something that you, that you would do? Um, that's an interesting question. I think, Certainly his music has, um, if not been in part of inspiration for many things I've done, uh, could definitely be in, you know, in one or two projects uh, that I work on. Um, and yeah, uh, and beyond that, who knows? But I, I'm absolutely not against it. In fact, I think it's, it could be a really beautiful thing and uh, potentially actually this next project, it might be. <laughs> well, that's good to hear, I think, because... Uh this kind of history. I mean, many, we've lost so many uh, of, of those musicians who were around at the time, who gave us the soundtrack of our lives, 
who made the unbearable slightly more bearable, uh, and Yuma Sakela, and, and I named so many others, and, and, and Johnny was one of those. So um, how would you, how would he want us to celebrate him, do you think, before we've got about like five minutes left? How should we, what should we do with dear ancestor Johnny? Um, I, I just think that, I'll go for it, yes. Oh, uh, okay. Um, geez, I don't know. I mean, I think that, you know, music is such a personal thing, and, and I think that people will have a, a deep connection to the music that he's written uh, and the moments that they've shared in, in his art, and I think that that's a beautiful thing. Um, beyond that, you know, we, we just feel grateful to be able to celebrate the man he was and the principles that he lived by and to try to celebrate a way of being or a way of seeing each other in South Africa. You know, to the, the, the mm. idea of human connection beyond, beyond religion, beyond race, beyond politics, the idea that we can transcend those things and find each other in, in, a, in such a beautiful way uh, is something that I think, I think my dad would be, um, he would be smiling above if he knew that that was the legacy that he left behind, if he could inspire and manifest that uh, in, in us as a people. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, songs like uh, uh, anthems like Asim Bonanga as well, you know, once again, the, the politics in the songs were always personal. Uh, they took you to the pain mm -hmm. of people missing leaders and those killed. And he didn't, so his music did become political, but mostly it was out of deep love for a culture that welcomed him, a language that gave him expression and a, and, and a ma ma method of dancing as a warrior. He was a warrior. He was an incredible warrior. Um, it's, it's, uh, yeah, one has to always watch them. We've got about three minutes left. Uh, just to say to everybody that the book will be available uh, from the Daily Maverick Bookshop and everywhere else. There are people online asking whether the book will be available internationally. I take it, is, I take it, it will be on Amazon and, and other, book, uh, other platforms. Um, um, yeah, as soon as uh, as soon as we have news on that, we will announce it. But uh, we, we we can't can't speak on that just yet. <laughs> okay, okay, good. Well, that, yeah, people can yes. just look out for it. It's there, uh, and there are some magnificent photographs in here as well. I mean, Johnny uh, uh, as a young boy, which we haven't seen before. Look at that. Look at him and his mom and your grandmother. Look at that. Oh, that's not lovely. Look at that little face. Yeah. yeah. So, so you know, it, they really it was lovely to have that. Oh, uh, yeah, Rex, look at this. Yeah, Rex is little dog. But, uh, you yeah. know, those eyes are there, those curious eyes. And I see in both of you so many of his man mannerisms talking and ways that you <laughs> So it's lovely uh, to see you both here. And thank you for, thank you. for uh, being with us. And all of you who joined us today, um, I've gone back to your dad's catalog, his back catalog, and also the new stuff that I sort of kind of didn't, you know, Pass me by because I was busy doing other stuff, you know, and it's magnificent. I love it. Daughter of Eden, also a beautiful song. He also mm. played with, with various genres. So thank you to you and to your mom, mm. if she's watching, or everybody else for your family's um, gift and the book. Yeah. Um, love you, Ma. And all of you. Yeah. And, and I hope we do meet sometime and we get to see you, the, the product of both your works. And uh, so thank you for joining us, guys. And thank you, everyone else. Uh, we'll post the link later on. Take care. Thank, you. Thank you so much for having us. Cheers, guys. Enjoy the book. Take care. Take care.